Zentraholics. Welcome to Synthaholics. Thank you so much for downloading this episode. Today I have myself, Aaron O'Brien, and we have our returning guest, Guy Davis from Rocky Mountain Geek Tank and, well, many other things. But, Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, Guy's been on numerous shows, so if you don't know Guy, <laughs> right. this, must, this might be the what? first time you're listening to the show. I was going to say, if you don't know me, who are you? If you don't know Guy by now, you right? will never, never know. Um, so, Guy, um, uh, we got a trailer for Lower Decks. We finally did. Yeah, we finally get to see that. Which, you know, considering that it's coming out August, what, is it 6th? It's August 6th, It's, it's right? soon, yeah. It's at the end of summer here coming up. Yeah. And, it's, it's like, and so it's like only like a handful of weeks away. Yeah. I'm kind of shocked this is the first time we've ever seen actual live footage <laughs> what what's your what's your hot take on it so i i expect i've got it well most most people who've listened know that i have a degree in animation which yeah. means that animation is i'm i'm extraordinarily picky about animation mm-hmm. i have hated south park since the very very beginning <laughs> not because south parks particularly you know, like offensive or anything like that, but I hate the animation, right? Uh-huh. Um, so, and and there have been a number of times. I was a lot more uh, picky when I was younger, in my 20s and my 30s, and I'm, I'm mellowing out a little. The animation on this is acceptable. It's passable. I'm, I'm actually okay with it. Um, it does not offend me. Uh-huh. Um, but there's there does seem to be some toilet humor, so I'm like, well... That's going to, I don't know. Yeah. Because um, that was kind of one of my problems with Orville right off the bat was a lot of toilet, the, the toilet humor and, yeah, yeah. Po- you know, and potty humor and stuff like that. But Orville grew out of it quick. And so Orville got better. And I, and I appreciated that. Thanks, Seth. Appreciate right, it, man. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think, I think I'm going to be okay with it. Uh, so, I have, you watched, have you watched? Um, did you did you watch um, uh, Rick and Morty at all? I've seen a handful of Rick and Morty. So it's very reminiscent to me it's the same animation same. style. Yeah, yeah. yeah that um, Mike uh, McMahon. Yeah, it's the same house. And uh, it seems like right now, from what I'm seeing, like a Rick and Morty light, uh, not as crude, maybe. So, Maybe, yeah. I, well, I don't, I don't know, know if we can handle crude in Star yeah. Trek that well. I mean, I know that they've been pushing into language. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and I've said this before. I'm like, you know, it's funny. There are some zones that I feel are probably more acceptable than others in Star Trek. Right. Right. Um, I feel like nudity would actually be fine in Star Trek because I think I feel like the original series was trying to push into that all the time. Right. And they just couldn't get away with it because it was 1960 and you couldn't do that. Yeah. But the way that William Ware Tice, I'm trying to adjust my microphone, I apologize. Uh, the way that William Ware Tice did with his dresses and everything like that, it was clear that if they could have gotten away with naked women, they would have. Yeah. I. Uh, I th- so this, weren't they at first talking about this being like, uh, a show that would be on Nickelodeon or something, or is that a different episode, a different animation series? I think this was that one. I don't think this is going to be on, <laughs> no. on Nickelodeon. No, I think it's funny <laughs> that, the, that there's there's already naked people in this show. Yeah, and, yeah. and it, that that's good. That's fine. I can accept mm-hmm. that. It's the potty humor. I don't know about potty humor. That's uh, one a, of the interesting. things that that kind of that breaks it for you. It does. 
It really does. Um, I, I feel like that might be, I don't know if that's going to break it whenever I watch it or not, but I mean, and they could handle it well and it might be actually okay. Mm-hmm. Like it might be good uh, if you were to look at it and say, well, like for ex- example, we all know that cleaning the holodecks must be a hellacious <laughs> job. <laughs> no, and there's a scene where she's cleaning up the the goop or whatever, right? Yeah, right. and that's got to be a hellacious job. And I'm sure. And so I think all of us can take a little bit of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink from that, and that's okay, you know. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I I gotta say though the 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 cleanup of the holodeck it's a great joke, but to me, wouldn't you just take any of that matter and then just beam it and put it into the matter stream. Of, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it 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 seems a silly thing to do. You know, like you're you're not going to be mopping up after, you know, Barclays no. orgy, right? You know, or no, whatever no, you plan to do. Of course not. And I agree. Um, and in fact, Dave, uh, our my co-host. Oh, by the way, we should also congratulate Dave. <laughs> yep, congratulations, Dave. <laughs> he got married uh, a couple days ago. Yeah, so that's why he's not on this episode, and he, uh, yeah, he, uh, uh, he's enjoying his honeymoon, uh, COVID style, right? At he's at home. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> it really does. I gotta say, I mean, oh, what, a, what a, what a, what a, what a time to get married. But you know, they didn't know when they made those plans. In fact, they had to scale everything down. But um, Dave all, often made the joke that. He doesn't even think toilets have in the in in the um, uh, Star Trek universe would even have plumbing. They would just beam out the waste. Yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, and you can I just mean, take that waste and just recirculate it into whatever just, the matter that they're using. Yeah, you pee into a little jar, and then the jar goes. There you go. It's and coffee it's now, and it's coffee now. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I like it. I like, I like the comedy. I like, I, I'm, I'm into goofiness. I mean, the original, uh, Star Trek animated series is silly, um, uh, but not, in, not meant to be silly. Right. It's silly and, inadvertently. Yeah. And, uh, I still enjoy it. I enjoy the wackiness of it. And I kind of always like animation for that matters that they can, uh, they can make things as crazy as they want. Like Rick and Morty I, is to me is one of the more brilliantly written shows uh, for sci-fi in, in a while. It's just, it's just so off the wall and they, they're just allowing themselves to take crazy risks and do crazy things. And, you know, it's just fun, you know, and I don't know how far they're going to push the envelope here with lower decks, but I, you know, I, I, it, I was kind of like laughing a little bit. I, I don't want it to be so silly that it's like not even a good show, though. Right. The problem with Star Trek is that it's an intellectual show. Right. So there are a lot of things that can fit intellectualness. And what I'm worried about is we can take humor in an intellectual way. As a case in point, we all think about the holodecks and how right. nudge, nudge, happens? wink, wink. What happens but, after? But that's intellectual and highbrow. You don't say, you know, what's going on. We all just nod and understand. You know right. what I mean? Right. Exactly. Um, and so it, that that I consider to be, you know, humorous and funny. And it's, you know, it's just a thing. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I worry about lowbrow humor. You know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of like a... Well, how did you feel about like the the JJ reboots? I mean, that there was a lot of lowbrow humor thrown out in that. I mean, I know some of it's just to make laughs, right? I mean, like the puffy hands. That's actually normal Star Trek style humor. You know, when when he was like, I can't feel top. my tongue and numb tongue. And yeah, yeah, the numb tongue and the, and the puffy hands and stuff like that. That was funny and that was cute and I liked that mm-hmm. because that is the kind of stuff that I think would happen between McCoy and Kirk. Right. You know what I mean? I feel like that fits the character. McCoy would give him something that I mean, that's like the the orange juice that he mixed the Therian extract in. Yeah. Right? I mean right. that that sounds like McCoy. That fits. Yeah. Right? yeah. And and yeah. harassing Spock. That sounds like something McCoy would do. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But that's not exactly what I call low brow. And actually, even though I know a lot of people give the 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 Kelvin Universe movies grief, you know, all, all two of those Kelvin movies. <clears throat> so. <Sure>. Um, <laughs> Yeah, one of them we don't talk about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that one. Yeah, right. But anyway, yeah, the first and the third. Um, yeah, I, I liked. I, I mean, the first one I felt like was just a romp. You know, they right. just they didn't have any real major plot for it. They, didn't they were really just, have... just trying to reinvent the series, breathe yeah. new life into it. And I, there wasn't they, anything wrong with that. It, they did successfully. I mean, I had some qualms, but I was willing to let things go. And then right. The one that shall not be named. <laughs> I can't <laughs> let that one go. Yeah, I know. I, I tried. I tried to like it. I think it there, there's 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 points of it I do like, but I don't think it's all there. It's not worth it for me. Um, my my wife and my wife was talking to my kid tonight at dinner, and she's like, "Well, Into Darkness was my least favorite Star Trek film," and I was like, "Well, there you go." I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, my my wife my wife's geek but she's not a trekkie necessarily right you right. know but she's geeky enough that she enjoys watching star trek you know so yeah she's yeah, more yeah. of a hoovian so okay um but yeah. it's but it's a it's an interesting thing that even she thinks as sort of an outsider not necessarily a direct outsider but sure sure you know yeah, someone absolutely. who's not not necessarily a trekkie like we're trekkies and so you kind of have to take some of the things that we say with a grain of salt right right well i guess we'll just have to see where lower decks takes us i mean yeah. it's gonna be what 10 episodes i believe it's not gonna I be guess. a lot not gonna be it's a lot, gonna be a lot. Yeah, and i think so. they're all done and in the can so we'll have to see what happens i'm curious i'm curious yeah. i'll give it i'll give it a shot it could be think- fun it could be fun. It could be fun. So we, we plan on talking about that, especially, uh, especially after we're going to get through this, uh, the, the expanse here, try to get caught up, and then we'll jump onto Lower Decks afterward just because, you know, it's exciting. Yeah. I'm, ex- I'm excited to see a uh, new track and see what else is going on. But Any but, new track is good new track. Uh, within reason. Within <laughs> we, reason. We, we, we've had our, we've, we've dissected Discovery and Picard quite a bit. So, uh, we, we're kind of on the fence with a lot of, and Dave is kind of like, eh. He's off the know. fence. Yeah. He's kind of on the other side now. He's, yeah, I, there's parts of it I like, and there's parts of it I'm like, I don't understand why they're making those decisions. And I don't know. That's for another show. For another show. Um, I, I'm still firmly in the Picard Discovery camp, so. Okay, good. So you could right. have me on there to offset Dave. Yeah, yeah, the the, the sweet and sour, right? Um, so uh, we are doing uh, the expanse again. Oh, and by the way, just for our listeners, uh, our Dune uh, book club series, we will not be doing that this week, just because Dave isn't around. So we're going to um, uh, hit it up a week after. So you get a week off. And it's been twenty five years since I read Dune. Yes. So, so I could help you, but I wouldn't be able to help you. Yes, it, it wouldn't be <laughs> wouldn't be good if you haven't read it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. So we'll, we'll get into doc, uh, Dr. Kine's uh, chapter introduction. That'll be uh, not this week, but next week. So, okay. all right, all right, guys. So uh, this is the episodes we're covering: Static and Godspeed. This is season two, starting episode three, and then going to episode four, and uh, Static first aired February 8th, 2017. And uh, we we ended up with the uh, Miller killing Dresden in the episode before and the face-off with the UN ships in Mars and uh, Mars just de- uh, destroying their, uh, shooting their moon and destroying it. And that's where we kind of... Uh, end up in this episode right um and uh we we're we're still getting more glimpses of the marsh martian marines and um we're setting up for bobby there, there are a lot of a lot of a lot of fighting in, with uh with the one one uh, marine that he's, he's uh for, he was born on earth but then he uh moved to mars with his family so he was only like five but they kind of hold that against him so it's, right. a constant, it's, it's a constant theme through this episode. 
So we get a little bit of that. And then we also get Christian, who's um, uh, she is uh, trying to get out of this uh, mess uh, with uh, Earth and Mara starting this uh, this fight. And she's talking to uh, Airwright and um, Airwright just wants to wipe out Mars. And he said that um, Airwright reminds Christian that Earth must come first. So um, and then we jump over to Tycho. Uh, station and they're just trying to put their ship uh the the Rosatante back together and uh it's just they took a lot of damage they really did yeah and uh and drummer we get to meet we get to see drummer i love drummer drummer is one of my favorite characters yeah so i'm not that far into the series after these next couple episodes so dave says that um the character really gets more robust Oh yeah, she's she's one of my favorites of the series. Um, really, Drummer has always been one of my favorites. Even in the book, she's pretty cool. Um, yeah. But but they they make her they like Bobby and Drummer are probably my two favorites of the whole series as far as secondaries go. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because they're secondary characters, obviously not the mains. But uh, but yeah, Bobby and Drummer are like the best characters. I just love those guys. Um, and so we finally get to see Drummer here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. But, no, it's uh, fine. Yeah. It's cool. This is cool. the first time Drummer meets Naomi, and uh-huh. that's actually like a good thing too because they're both they're both uh, part of the the Belters. They're both Belters, and they know it. Um, and you know, because of course, all the tattoos are probably a good <laughs> you know, giveaway a clue. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's a giveaway. Right, right, right. <laughs> so. Um, and let's see, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, dr- we, we get, uh, in- well, she's been in the episodes before, but this is like the first, the real, first like, time she meets Naomi, Naomi, but also she has like a, a really strong role for the first time. So that's the first time we've seen that. Um, uh, obviously Holden and, uh, Miller, uh, well, hold pretty pissed off at Miller for killing Dresden and, uh, Fred Johnson just lets Miller go. He says, just get on a ship and get the hell off of the station. I don't care where you go. And um, Amos drops off Miller's stuff, and they have some couple drinks. And Amos basically just says, yeah, you're you're pretty much done with the crew, so don't try to come back. And uh, <laughs> and he, then he also says, you keep uh, picking fights with the wrong people. Wrong so, people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you got to love Amos. Yeah, no, Amos is uh, pretty direct. Uh, Naomi and Holden uh, they have a conversation, and Holden's pissed off still with Miller. And he says, "When are you going to let that go?" And he says, "I got to clean up Miller's mess from killing Dresden." So now we got to figure out everything that's going on with the proto molecule. So, um, and uh, Miller gets still at the bar, and he gets picked up by uh, the, uh, if you want to call the uh, the Belter Diego. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they go hanging out together. Uh, and then they uh, start talking to the prisoner uh, that they was well, the prisoners that they got from uh, their their raid there. Cortazar, yeah. Cortazar is really messed up. And it's like we don't know how what degree of messed up they actually are <laughs> until we start finding out more about it. So um, he uh, seems completely disconnected. And they're like, well, Dresden's dead. You can go and do whatever you want. You can go live your hap- a happy life. And he goes, and he's like, not even interested. He's only wants to. He's only interested in this proto molecule. So, um, so, um, and that's another one where Amos does Amos, and you're like, where did you grow up, Amos? Yeah, because right. the things that Amos goes in and the angles that Amos goes for. Are always so weird. Yep. Amos uh, realizes that this this guy is only thinking one way, and we get uh, we get a kind of a uh, the information on on why he's like that that um, that he his neurons were um, messed up by this magnetic procedure, which basically just kind of this transcranial procedure that kind of make him uh, apathetic not even caring about anybody else but himself and what he wants. Right. So, but Amos, like you said, he goes uh, and he starts telling him what he saw on Eros and he starts feeding him the information. He just eats it up. He just, he wants to know more. And then finally 
Amos just shuts it off like a tap, just like, nope, that's it, and walks out, and this guy kind of freaks out, like, what What else did you see? What else did you see? So he he realizes, like you were saying, like Amos sees something that's totally different, and he's like, he's like a pedophile. Like, he's uh, he's only interested in that. And, he, and when you talk about making a, a vaccine for the proton molecule, he, it's like you're taking it away from him. He doesn't want to take it away. He wants to be involved in it. He wants to see more of it. He wants mm-hmm. to so. And uh, it's more explained that this uh, proton molecule is, uh, needs to be fed more biomass to start learning. And then they also realize that there's this um, the stream, which we get um, – uh, we kind of get introduced to that a little bit before with Miller when he's with Diego. He's listening to some weird music, and it's yeah. actually the the stream that's coming out of Eros, and they just put beats behind it, <laughs> and so it's like this weird uh, message. And it's a uh, and uh, what they realize that the streaming uh, message coming out of Eros is actually a countdown building to something. But they're like, "What's it building to? What's a countdown for?" Like, I don't know. Well, it's got, it can't be good, right? Uh, Christian, uh, back on Earth on the UN, she was uh, she's contacts Fred Johnson through us like a secret channel and asks like, please help stop this war between Earth and Mars. What can you give me? Anything? And he gives her the stealth ship information and where it's at. So they go exploring that, and then they find out that the stealth ship is has crew members on it that are from. Um, uh, protogen, which is run by uh, Jules Pierre uh, Meow. 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 I always say Meow. 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 So, uh, and back on the Rasatante, uh, the Alex is training of his last mission. He just keeps on going over simulations, trying to become a better pilot. So he's he took it seriously that like I think he said some twenty people died, yeah. uh, and that he's last struggling from survivor's guilt. Right, right. And he's like, I got to do better. I, it's this next time, no one's going to die. So, And then at the very end of this episode, uh, Miller comes in. He says, I want to go to Eros. He goes uh, goes into Fred Johnson saying, I want to go to Eros. And he suggests that the Naboo should take Eros and push it into the sun. And that's how we end. And then we go to Godspeed. And Godspeed is where the um, Christian and uh, the people um, that she works for her they find the pro, uh, the stealth ship and the protogen uh, survivor or not survivors, but uh, dead crew members on the ship, and uh, so they link this all to Jules uh, Pierre Mia, Mao. So, meow. And, you are not going to let that one go, are you? No, I just it's funny. It's just like I just keep saying meow. Can we call her Julie Meow too? Julie Meow. Yeah. So uh, so she's making this con- connection, and she already knew that the drives were made. Uh, on on Earth for these uh, these stealth ships, so this was obviously a um, she she's putting it all together that uh, that Jules and Protogen and his corporation are all uh, are behind a lot of this. So, and then Miller and uh, Fred Johnson and uh, Holden and Naomi all meet, and they basically make the plan that they're going to steal the Nabu, and they're going to use that uh, to help push. Eros into the sun so they can get rid of the proto molecule for good. And uh, Naomi's last last words are the, the Mormons are going to be pissed. Right. So well, in, in the Nauvoo is a gigantic ship and they call it their, their, uh, their temple. And it's got a whole like inside, you know, like farming area and, you know, uh, atmosphere. And it's, it's quite, quite elaborate. Yeah, quite, quite a lot of work has been put into it, and I can't imagine how much money because the Nauvoo is supposed to go to a distant star system, so they can the Mormons can move there and make their lives there. Hopefully, that it's a uh, it's a habitable planet. Later on, we get uh, Christian and uh, Arite uh, gets uh, Jules uh, Mao into uh, their office and starts saying, "This is informal, but we want to know why Protogen is working one of the stealth ships, and it's all." through your company it's like so what's going on and jules just basically says like this is um this is an opa uh moles infiltrated protogen and they and they orchestrated all the stuff to build the stealth ship and christian's like wait a second so they did this all within budget they built these secret ships without you knowing 
they staged this whole war and uh they kept they they kept everything uh secret for that long it's like we got to get people like that working for us right and uh you know so she's calling him on his bluff and you know Airite keeps on cuz Airite and obviously Jules are working together and i think Christian's pretty much onto it at this point back at Tycho station uh we get um Fred Johnson and Miller and everyone else holding crew they stage a radiation leak in Nauvoo and they get all the Mormons off the ship. Uh, they, they steal the Nauvoo and, and all its grandeur. So <laughs> it, I, it, that. Yeah, it had a, a slight, it, it was probably more grand, but it had a slight feeling of uh, uh, Star Trek uh, three where they steal the enterprise. So yeah. It had a little bit of that feeling going on, but uh, a little more, a little more grand. Uh, so they, they make it to Eros and they're uh, going to start, placing bombs to basically melt the exterior so nothing can get in or out of Eros. That's the idea. And um, and then, obviously, the Nauvoo is going to take it and push it into uh, the sun, you know, so it gets destroyed completely. So they start putting that, and then uh, Mars and UN ships are kind of flying in their direction on their way, and, but then they find an unknown ship that's just sitting there. And they find out that these are like, not Greenpeace, but they're sort of like doctors without borders kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And they're trying to help the people. Well, that's what, at least what they identify themselves. And at first they say that nobody's been, gotten on the ship because all the airlocks have been sealed. But uh, later Miller, as he's out there on a spacewalk on Eros, placing and arming all these nuclear bombs on it, he finds that um, uh, one of the airlocks have been hacked and they've been open. And there's a guy dead inside the airlock with a proto molecule all coming out of him, like you saw with uh, Julie Mao. And uh, he has the same uh, ship at, uh, ship name as this uh, doctor ship. And Holden has to make the decision what to do with him. And he ends up, he asks them to stop, but they won't. He even tells them exactly who he is, because first he was posing as a Martian gunship. Part of the MCRN. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then he ends up uh, just... Uh, shooting him down and he's pretty pissed at it that he had to make that decision but he does right. make it a second miller unfortunately uh after that is uh bombarded by the the wreckage wreckage of that ship that oh, from the the, yeah. yeah from the destruction of that ship and they have to uh he's he's you know obviously trying to you know hide from it but one of the uh nuclear bombs they placed on there is like uh is messed up and it, yeah, and the uh, um, detonator, uh, what does it only have, like a couple seconds per... It has 60 seconds. And then it has to be reset. And if it's not reset by hand, it'll go off. Yeah. So um, he, he tells Diego, because uh, Diego's the one that, you know, is, he's holding it and trying to reset the thing. He says, tells Diego to get out of there, and I'll, I'll handle it. He just basically realizes there's nothing else he can do. And Miller seems to be kind of on a death wish anyways, after everything, so... He sort of just like, yeah, I'm going to go into this into uh, Eros and I'm going to try to see what's going on. And I'll bring the bomb with me. Right. And, and just before he does that, uh, the Navu is supposed to do its thing and start in and push Eros into the sun. And Navu completely misses. And it's like, what happened? How could that happen? And and they find out that Eros had moved itself. Moved. And that's how we end this uh, episode. Uh, what do you think of these two episodes, Guy? So uh, I I really liked season two a whole lot. Um, it was a good a good solid season of building up all of the characters. Um, some interesting observations that I made. Of course, this is a very big change episode. The first one um, mm-hmm. when we talk about uh, uh, not Godspeed but Static. Static yeah. is a change episode. There's a lot of pivot with Alex, Naomi, and Miller mm-hmm. that's going on. Naomi is a character. First of all, uh, I'm trying very hard to remember back on the book on this one because there's a couple of things I noticed when looking stuff up. One of them is that the Marasmus is only on the TV show and not in the book. Okay. But it holds so many pieces that I'm like, okay, so what was the Marasmus then in the book? Because there had to have been... Something that caused that same. I mean, this is still going the same direction as the books did. I mean, Eros moved in the books, and 
you know, and the, 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 the that was part of it. And, you know, they were going to run the, the Navu into it. And, you know, that was like, this is all going along the same spot di- direction as the book. So now I'm like, where did the, wh- 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 what part was played by the Merasmus? Huh? So that's yeah, yeah. kind of an interesting, interesting thing. Um, big, big change episode though. I mean, you can see as far as characters go, Alex is stuck very much in this survivor guilt moment. Um, right. Naomi is doing what Naomi does a lot in the entire series. She has questionable allegiances. She's very dedicated to what she's doing, but she's easily led astray. And hmm. you start to see this with drummer. Not necessarily because mm. Drummer's going to lead her astray at all, but there's this serious call for her to go back to OPA and go back to the Belter lifestyle. And right. it's almost like she doesn't quite understand where where everybody is trying to go, where James is going in this entire thing. She doesn't quite know. I don't think she grasps what James wants until the end of this season. Like huh. totally, fundamentally understands what's going on. I think she's just doing well. Uh, James said we should destroy the proto molecule. Okay, <laughs> you know, but she's still not quite there. She doesn't know whether that's something that needs to happen or not. So it's funny you you got a little more hindsight than I do because I you know I'm I'm only a few more episodes ahead, so I'm not quite clear what happens after this. So. Uh, I, especially with her character, because her character seems the most brilliant out of all of them. She's very, very smart. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like so that's one of those things. That's one of the things that that attracts me to James S. A. Corey's writing. Mm-hmm. She's very smart, but she's not very wise sometimes. She misses her wisdom check. <laughs> She yeah. fails her wisdom role. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And there's times where Naomi really does blow her wisdom check. And that's mm. that makes her very real to me. Mm-hmm. She's a very, very smart person. I mean, heck, I felt that I was that way for a while. Very smart, but not very wise. Um, and made a lot of stupid mistakes that later on I'm like, look, I should have known better than that. Right. Well, we you all know? do that. We all make those. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. But it's But it makes her real. You know, the right. stereotypes always like to play that if they're smart, they're also wise. Yeah, it's not, I, 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 I see I see it very different, you know, with the, a lot of people. I, I've known very smart people and they make very poor decisions. <laughs> right. And I've made and, I, and I've known some people that aren't very book smart and they, they make very good decisions when they sizing up situations and people like and Amos. Like yeah. Amos is the flip of 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 and, uh, Naomi. What's interesting with Amos is that he, I was telling David about this a couple episodes ago that uh, what I like about Amos is that he knows his limitations. Like he knows there's certain things he's just not good at. Right. And, and he's willing to give agent his agency up to people that that are better at that certain things. It's because he's got a very high wisdom, even though he doesn't have a really high intelligence. Yeah. It's, it's um, very he's interesting. Very wise. He knows like he's streetwise. Hardcore. We find out a lot more about Amos later on in the story. That's um, what in I fact, hearing. yeah, yeah. Uh, we we they actually haven't even gotten to Amos. They're right now in the TV show, and God, I hope they make the next season. Right now at the TV show, they're hitting that book, the book mm. where we find out all about Amos. Interesting. Um, that's the next book, so that should be season six. Okay, as they're moving along. Because that book is one of my favorites to the series. I love that book. Um, because we do go deep into, into Amos and where he came from and where he's like, you know, what what causes him to be who he is. And we get peaches. I love peaches. You'll have to figure that out when we get there. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's like there are all these these pieces here, but my feeling is I love this one because this is a pivot episode. First of all, Naomi and drummer have a history that goes on throughout this, this entire series. The two of them work either against each other or with each other a lot in the, for, for you know, some very critical points where Naomi yeah. and drummer are 
work together in either conflict or work in parallel. And mm. so it's nice. I, I love watching the first scene where drummer's like, hey, you're obviously from Iraq, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. so cool, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's always a fun one. Uh, of course, Miller makes a big change in this episode, too, going from I'm a cop, I'm a cop, I'm a cop to maybe I'm OPA. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? or, or he's just, yeah, he's, he's, he's just I'm going I'm I'm to shave just my belter, head. Yeah. Yep. Right. He's going to shave his head. So now he's going to be totally OPA. And it's like yeah. he may not be belter. He may not be. He doesn't know what he is. Yeah. But just, that's important. He's a gutter. Because. Punk. Right. Because we're we're about to hit into a point where Miller's character has a major change too, and so yeah. it's critical that we're starting to see the destabilization of Miller here as he starts to lose his identity. Because yeah. you're right, he's he's got kind of a death wish going for him right now. Yeah. Yeah. But he's always had a death wish. He I didn't guess have, so. He yeah. didn't really care about his life. In fact, he didn't care about anything until he got Julie Mao's entire story. Right. At which time. Until, or until he got Julie Mao's uh, case. That's the word I was looking for, case. Mm-hmm. Until he took Julie's case, he really didn't, like, have a reason to live. Right. Um, you know, because they just kept throwing him around. You know, whatever. I just live on a, a stupid station. I hate the stupid station. And I hate everything about it. And I hate my life. And yada, yada, yada. And then, in a way, I think he kind of fell in love with Julie Mao. Oh yeah, I totally. Did. Even though it wasn't like what you'd think it would be, it's right. a weird falling in love with Julie Mao sort of situation. Maybe falling in love with the idea of her. Yeah, he falls in love with the concept of Julie Mao, right. um, and that's, or should we say, Julie Meow? Anyway, meow. Um, we, we were really into this. <laughs> we, got, we could say Claire Meow, and then <laughs> <laughs> we got all of them. Chairman um, Meow. Chairman Meow. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, that's going to be the joke for this episode. So, Chairman I really meow. like, uh, I he's got this obsession with her, which really transcends uh, just a like a sexual attraction or something like that. Yeah. It's very no, he, he's, he's totally romanticized this, 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 this person. Movie. Yeah, yeah. And now that she's dead, he's got He's kind of going back to, I well, don't, maybe I, I don't care about life anymore. But now he's seeing her. Mm, yeah, that's also important. yeah, yeah. And he's even admitted. He goes, I know it's bullshit. I, you know, I, I, but I see her. She's standing in front of me. You know, and he's, you know, he admits that he, he, it sounds crazy, but right. So I mean, it's like she's she's haunting him, and. Yeah. You know, and and that's that's, and I love the way that they're playing this. And, you know, is this what is this him slowly breaking down and going insane? It's a good question. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I I don't know if he's totally insane, but I, I he seems like he's definitely. Um, I don't know. It's kind of weird. I don't. What would you consider if you start seeing ghosts of somebody just for a moment? I, I don't know. I don't even know what the psychological. Um, name of that would be well uh hallucinations so well, yeah it's a hallucination I mean, but like what what kind of like what does that for a person like what breakdown i mean yeah, other than schizophrenia but like but he's too nerve, old to... he's having like a nervous breakdown yeah possibly yeah i mean he's well i think that's what they're trying to, to allude to is that he's having a nervous breakdown right gotcha it, it it is a transition episode for sure, and I'm honestly even the the next episode after that, um, you know when we get to Godspeed, it's it's the start of what's happening. It's sort of like almost the end of the chapter of what what we're gonna find out with the what's going on with this proto molecule and stuff like that with on Eros, but um, you know we're kind of just like putting you know the key in the ignition and and turning it because we're right. seeing what's gonna happen from there on. And I love the thing about, there are a couple of things that I love about Godspeed. Mm-hmm. Um, Avicerella calling Johnson is a major uh, moment in the yeah. entire series. Mm-hmm. Now, first of all, 
I love Christian Abercerella. Oh, I love I her. I love her in the book. She's one of my favorite. And, yeah. <clears throat> When they when they cast her, mm-hmm. I was just like, "Well, that's a perfect cast." Mm-hmm. When they cast Shore, yeah, as as her, I mean, they, oh, she is perfect, a perfect Avicerella. Um and it, it and and so I'm just like, that's just like the bestest character ever. <laughs> but, I do. I, what's I so think funny she's great. is in the yeah. books. In the book, she curses up a storm, and so the first couple of seasons, I was like, "Well, she's not I don't cursing." Know. And then they finally released the non-edited versions, and oh, really? she is dropping f bombs all over the place. And really? I'm like, "Yeah, now that's the Avicerella I know." That's hilarious. Very funny, and it's just beautiful because I, I'm not I'm not one for language, but if that's the character, be true to it. You yeah, know some I mean? characters. Yeah, some characters definitely do a lot of cursing. Oh yeah, that's just some the thing. People do, some people do a lot of cursing. Sure, it's yeah. just the way it goes. Yeah. Um, I mean, me personally, I don't care for it, but that's okay. It's you know, uh-huh. it's about it's about it's all about Avicerella, and it's it's so so. I they did a great job casting her as the exactly as you imagine her in the books. She's a grandmotherly character who. As soon as the door is closed and she doesn't have to be grandma anymore, <laughs> you know? Yeah, she lets it, her freak flag fly. Right. And she becomes awesome. So there's that. But this is a big moment. The connection between Avicerella and Johnson is big. That's a big moment in the politics of the system. Because you now have a quiet line between two of the three powers. Right. Okay. Um, the the whole story of the expanse is all about a terrestrial war that is being interrupted by aliens, mm-hmm. and they're mm-hmm. slow to catch on to this. Right? They're like, Wait, and they're busy what's trying to war. Wait, what is happening s- here? They're slow to catch on, and the aliens. That countdown is a big deal. Right. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did uh, I can't. I'm trying not to give spoilers further down. We haven't had the incident on Venus yet, have we? No, I well, not yet. So that's okay. That's gonna yeah, happen it's, that's here. next. There's an yeah. incident on Venus that's a big deal on this one too. Yeah, um, but I think that's only a few episodes away. Yeah, I think it's and yeah, it's, it'll happen pretty soon. So, um, so you guys can talk about that when it gets there. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, what do you think about the uh, the scientist, uh, you know, basically a guy who's a prisoner who's, you know, his, his brain has been just sh- shut off for empathy? I find it. Well, that's that's all part of that's all part of our bad guys in this. This is there's a there's that corporation bad guy overstructure that's going on here. Right. That's that's sort of oppressing in. Um, right. Mao has been alluding to the fact that Avicerella is closing in on him yes. on this one and has been in this episode. He actually says, I'm mad at you for letting that happen. Um, you know, and it's like, you know, it, it still means that Mao knows that, that they're closing in on him. Right. 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 And so that corporation overrun, the things that that corporation does is, intriguing in a way because Mm -hmm. they're all sort of like that. They're all without empathy and it's that top level sort of, I don't care about people. We've got to fix this thing. We got to do this. Right. Yeah. 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 It gets in the way. Yeah. People. Yeah. People are just a inconvenience. Right. They're just slowing me down. Right. I don't know. It's so weird to me though. It's like, um, such a strange, um, I don't I don't know really how to how to to bring it uh into words but it's a strange uh vehicle to uh, get these guys to uh work on this terrible experiment. Um but it it is interesting at the same time. It's it's it's, a, it's an interesting vehicle but it's a uh, it's uh disturbing in a, in a lot of ways that they would actually make this this character do that. Or or all the characters like that. It is only the tip of the iceberg of what mm-hmm. this company is doing. <laughs> oh, geez. So this, this company is really bad, huh? It's nasty. Um, 
and and interesting in its own way. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's horrible, but it's it's the, the, this company is the reason why I will not show the expanse to my child <laughs> oh. for a long time. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of scenes just even in the first season. I was like, oh, yeah, my kids aren't going to be watching this anytime soon. I don't know. That was interesting to me. And um, I agree. I agree. It's it's a it's a strange turn of event. And I wouldn't I wouldn't have even imagined it. It's like such a weird, weird manipulation of their employees, I guess, what you want to call. Um, I thought the stealing of the Nauvoo was, took a lot of balls. And but just shows that Fred Johnson is com- was completely serious about uh, saving, you know, the whole universe and everybody on it. So strange from a guy who was, you know, nicknamed the butcher. Right. Well, so he's nicknamed the butcher for a specific reason. Right. For what happened at that. Uh, I forgot the name of the station, but mm-hmm. that uh, all those all those people got killed. So. Right. I but just, that's yeah. also. Mm-hmm. That's also one of the things. Again, uh, James S. A. Corey, which is two different authors that write together under one pseudonym, right. they worked really hard on this. There's a lot of interesting in and out of each character. Mm-hmm. Fred Johnson's title about being the butcher comes from specifically one faction of the warring groups in the solar system. So it's the people who were on the losing side. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's interesting that he either acquiesces to that name or something, but that's all survivor guilt for Johnson. How do you mean that he he feels, he feels, he feels guilty about what he did. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I find that that's a really deep part of Fred Johnson that I find really great about this series. I mean, that's what's really cool about the whole thing is that he's actually suffering from, I mean, like all the characters, we've got Alex suffering from survivor guilt in this episode. Right. You know, yeah, everybody yeah. is real. Yeah. The things that happen. And, and I mean, whenever the Marasmus has to be destroyed, I mean, it's clear that James is all messed up. James is pretty messed up. I remember pretty he pissed is off. Mad. That he, he is had mad to do that. that they forced him to shoot them. Yeah, and but he and, knew he didn't have a choice. Right, he didn't have a choice. He had to, and that was and, a, that was another tr- that was a trolley situation there. That, it really that, was. You, know, you push the guy off the bridge to save the ten guys down the track, kind of thing. And that's what he was doing, and he hates that. But it's interesting because yeah. Amos has James really pegged, mm-hmm. um, and that's and he says it. And, you know, bringing he's, up all of this, he says it when he's talking to Miller. Miller at the bar, right. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because at the bar, he's talking to Miller and he says, you know, he says James is, well, he says Holden, but he says James is the kind of person who is always right or always in the right or trying to be always in the right. right. He's a he's a paladin. He's a knight in shining armor. That's the way he sees himself. He hates when things go gray. And... And of course, that's why he's got. That's why. That's why James keeps Amos around, is because Amos is black. <laughs> he's just, Amos he's not makes even those gray. makes those choices right away. Yeah, and he'll make those choices, and he's ready to make those choices if Holden can't. Yeah, it, but Holden doesn't even want Amos to make those choices half the time. He gets right? pretty, is he sees it the way he he has to play it, and I don't know. I didn't like Amos at in the beginning, but I'm warming up to him slowly. Yeah. So, I mean, there's more to him than I thought originally. So understand that I love Amos in the same way that I love Kai Wen. Kai Wen. (laughs) Right. Because there are, it's, it's a, a real 10. He makes me have emotion. Well, Kai Wen on Deep Space Nine is, is literally like just a great written, written bad guy. Right. You That's know. exactly, and I'm not saying that Amos is a bad guy. I'm just no, saying but it's just like he's so deep. He yeah. makes me feel emotion, um, <laughs> right? And and the emotion that I feel for him is often pity. Yeah, you know, because the way Amos operates is sort of a, 
I got the short end of the stick and this is what's going to happen with my life now. You know? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And it's sort yeah. of uh, almost a, a resignation. A, uh, very pragmatic in a lot of ways. That's what yeah. I, I like about him. But um, I don't like that he's just so, you know, devil may care if I just, you know, take this person out or kill these people because they're they're in my way kind of thing or they're going to impede us or something like that he's very much like he's very pragmatic but he doesn't think of another option he's not he's a, he doesn't have the imagination it seems like that anything else is possible right well he's also a, a psychopath well exactly he and he's aware of it right he's aware right. he's a psychopath and he's aware that that's probably socially unacceptable and so he aligns himself with people who will hold him back so that he won't psychopathically kill everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what's fascinating about the character. He's a psychopath. He he is, he is interesting in that, in that aspect. Um, yeah. So I, a lot of changes, uh, Holden seems to stay the same, you know, Holden doesn't really change. Um, Holden doesn't have real changes here now. And neither does Amos. Yeah. Amos Amos is still just rolling along being Amos. So, yeah. Yeah, the but big like you said, are Miller, Naomi, and Miller. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting. Some interesting stuff. Also, I would like to point out that Amazon needs to get their Prime thing figured out. I swear to God. What do you mean? What do they do? Oh, I I started up these episodes, and it just kept sending me back to fifth season to watch oh, really? the end credits of the last episode over and over and over, <laughs> and I was like, I need to get back to second season. Oh, they wouldn't let you go back easily? Right, because it kept, it kept flipping me forward in the fifth season. And don't you like, want to keep watching? I was like, no, I don't want to watch that one. There's right only now. like 30 seconds of, of end credits left. No, I don't need to watch that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, so Amazon had some – I had some problems with Amazon right off the bat. Interesting. Interesting. So Amazon, uh, if you're listening, which you probably are actually, uh, <laughs> go, go, go ahead and fix your, your reader there, your playback. Some of us do hop around and rewatch. Yes. That's true, yeah. I because I, I I have to I've watched forward, but I have to keep on going back, and then I have to just kind of like figure out how to work the thing so it goes goes back to the right spot I want it to, you know. Because I have to rewatch it to talk about in the, these episodes and, and for our yeah. podcast. So, yeah, cool, man. So I don't know, just uh, I and I really, I mean, I know what's happening. You know what's going to happen here in the next episode or so, but. Uh, pretty exciting stuff so it's it's gonna be this is the big build uh this yeah. is the build towards leviathan wakes so yeah, yeah. um this it's is exciting. this is really where we are this is really intense yeah i love it it's great stuff and um yeah i just can't wait to get into more and like i said i've only gone so far and so i it's after a certain point that this will be the end of like what i know Oh, that's why you don't know anything about Johnson Caliban's War is where you find out all about that. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten episodes away. Oh, that would be a reason I didn't know about it. Yeah, it's ten episodes down. That's where we get more information about Johnson. So Interesting. Well, I'll we'll find out more as, as time goes on. So, uh, Guy, let's wrap this up. Why don't you tell our listeners everything, how they can find you and all the stuff that you are working on currently? Okay, you can find me uh, pretty much everywhere at gsdavisart.com or gsdavisart on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'm trying to tweet more. (laughs) I'm actually thinking about tweets. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm actually thinking about doing uh, one minute art episodes. So, nice. like art basics 101, little Different. things like uh, things that you know, you and I have been doing art for a long time. And sure, I, I know a lot of people get into art and they're like, I, I don't even know how to sharpen a pencil. You know, that's funny. I'm like, you know, it's like what? nobody knows what an HB pencil is versus a B pencil versus an H pencil versus an F pencil. You know, those yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I yeah. thought, you know, you know. It'd be kind of cool to just do like basics 101. So I've been thinking about doing that recently. It must be the um, teacher in you. It is the teacher in me. Um, I am broadcasting every morning from 10 to noon mountain time. Nice. Um, and I pretty much just draw and nice. people keep me company and you can join me on Facebook and, and I'll respond to you and you can just hang out with me. You can go to my, my Facebook page, which is GS Davis Hart. And uh, that's what I do. 
And you can watch me put together stuff. I've recently just done this really interesting piece, which was Pikachu versus Stitch. Nice. I thought it was very cute. Very cool. Um, so there you go. That's pretty much where you can find me. You can also find me uh, at Rocky Mountain Geek Tank, which is a, uh, a podcast for geek people, geeky people like us. And so uh, and they talk about <laughs> lots of crazy stuff They're all over the place sometimes. We They're... really are all over the place. Yeah. Um, we're going to have an interview this week with somebody, and I can't remember who it is, but it's a game person, somebody in the gaming industry. Nice. Um, so uh, we've Role, we, uh, role playing game? Yeah, role playing game industry, uh, board game industry. I think. Okay, cool. Not video game. Doesn't seem like it's video game. It seems like it's coming from the board game side. Gotcha. Um, but we're going to have an interview with him, so you can find me there. That's at uh, Facebook forward slash Rocky Mountain Geek Tank. So there you go. That's where you can find me. Awesome. Well, uh, definitely check out Guy's work. He's got a lot of work. He's did a lot of work for a Star, uh, Star Trek comic, and and he's got a bunch of other work that he's been working on as well for uh, his comics. So he's he's always producing really beautiful work, and you should really check out his stuff. So I appreciate um, that. Thanks. Yeah, no, you definitely do check out Guy's work. Uh, as for Synthaholics, you can find us at Synthaholics.com, and you can email us at uh, Synthaholics at Yahoo.com. You can uh, tweet at us at Synthaholics Duo on Twitter. Go to our Facebook group. You can go to Facebook forward slash groups uh, forward slash Synthaholics. And there you can find us and our community and a lot of Star Trek uh, stuff, jokes and stuff like that. And <laughs> uh, memes and all sorts of things happening there as, as always. If this show is something you want to support, please go to our Patreon, Patreon forward slash Synthaholics and uh, you can donate there. Um, guy. Thank you so much for joining us, and you know, thank um, you for having me. We're uh, going to be talking about talking about expanse for pretty much the end of this until we get into uh, lower decks, and uh, we'll, maybe we'll get you on for a couple more expanse episodes, and uh, we'll have to talk about lower decks when that comes out and get your take on all that, right? Because I, I'm, I'm all about that. <laughs> because I know you're you're going to have some something to say. I got something to say, people. Right. And I know that will be you at that point. So, um, so yeah, we'll have to talk, talk, uh, lower decks when that comes out as well. So, but, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Dave, uh, we'll see you next week and, you know, uh, we hope you have a great uh, week off on your staycation for your honeymoon. You know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully after COVID's over, you can actually go and do some, uh, real traveling and have some fun. Go someplace uh, unique and not just uh, staying around home. It's just such a weird time to be alive. You know, can't go anywhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's so, it very weird. It is weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, guys, uh, as always, uh, keep listening and live long and prosper one and all. Well, McCoy, my boy, come mix me a drink before.